So, welcome. Is anybody in here expecting to see content related to PS Cash? It's okay, put up your hand. You're in the wrong room. Uh, there was a scheduling change, and now, instead, in this room, I'm going to talk to you about a fascinating concept of making awesome PowerShell prompts. Uh, my name is Thomas Turner. I work at Microsoft. I'm not an evangelist or on the product team. I'm just a guy who uses the stuff, uh, who happens to have a blue badge. And before you ask, yes, this is seriously a talk on uh, things that I like to do and things that you can do to make your PowerShell prompt more interesting and useful and fun, honestly. Uh, why am I up here? The normal prompt is boring, right? It's like the PS and then it's the working directory you're in and lame, right? Like, come on, we can do better. Uh, but realistically, you're always looking at it when you're in the shell, right? Like every time you hit enter and you like don't accidentally kill your entire process, you see the prompt. It comes up. Most of you probably like don't think about it even. It's just there and whatever. It is what it is. And yeah, oh, I know I can change it, but why would I do that? Uh, but because you spend so much time looking at it, or you could sp you spend so much time seeing it at least, why not put it to work? Why not actually use it for what it's meant for, which is providing you useful information that you see every time uh, something actually happens on your console. And so there are a lot of ways to perform this activity of making your prompt more useful. And I'm going to show you what I do. And it will hopefully give you different ideas on what you could do. Uh, or you could just pill for mine. I'll make it available. Uh, and then we can just have the same. And that's fine by me, too. What could you include? Like, instead of just having the present working directory, here's just a brief list of completely reasonable things that you can put in your prompt uh, so that you can see it every time. And like on the left-hand side, there are things that are a little bit more predictable and reasonable, like the, uh, the history ID of the line that you just ran. I'll show you why that's helpful. Uh, the last exit code, whether the thing actually worked or not, uh, you don't know unless you just see the error. Uh, information about Git, like there's lots of modules like Posh Git out there that help you with things like that. Uh, and then on the right side, uh, it starts out kind of serious, like the name of the drive that you're in, that's helpful. Uh, and then we end up with stuff that's a little bit more out there, like your Wi-Fi status. You could pull that and stick it in there if that was a valuable place for you to see it. Uh, or ASCII art of cats or whatever you like to make ASCII art out of, because it's fun. Why not? Like, I'm serious. Put whatever you want in there. Uh, the question is, would you need a bigger monitor? The answer is, I don't know, maybe. Depends how much ASCII art you put in there. Uh, Jeff Hicks has a, a cool blog post on some of the crazy stuff that he's got in his. You should go check out, too. Uh, and you know what? You can do cool stuff for its own sake, too. Like I, The last slide was like pieces of information that you can add. But the default prompt is just white text on a blue background, which, again, Boring. You've all seen it. Like it's, it's useful, it's functional. But why don't we use some more interesting fonts and kind of have some cool characters in there uh, with utility that you'll see. Uh, colors are another thing that are fun to play with, which, again, sounds kind of silly, but this is a lighter-hearted session. This was supposed to go on Thursday. Um, sounds and animations, please don't if it's going to be the thing you use every day. But maybe it's your April Fool's, I just gave it to a coworker prompt. You know, uh, you, can, you can get creative here. Because the thing's going to run every time they hit enter. So, uh, The key to unlocking all this, don't read the stuff on the right. It's just a screenshot of one of the docs pages on Microsoft. The link is right there for reading more. Or just search Microsoft Docs and see escape sequences. Uh, what these are, if you're not familiar, they are special sequences of characters that you can type into the console to make cool stuff happen. Cool stuff like, OK, now read a little bit adding an underline, changing a color, changing a position of a character and where it's being placed. Um, ANSI escape sequences are basically using functions of the console to make a more attractive or visually interesting uh, thing happen. And so these are the key to uh, doing a lot of different colors. It's better than just go, like you could just go right host dash foreground color or something. Or you can use escape sequences, which don't have a dependency on write host. So if you're running somewhere that doesn't have write host or it's going to get weird, don't have to worry. These are just creating special strings 
that tell your console to behave in a way that isn't just put text on the screen. There's instructions embedded within that string. WTF, weird, thrilling fonts. Um, I'm not going to show you necessarily, but this GitHub link has a whole bunch of what are called Powerline fonts. Uh, Powerline uh, has come to mean a whole bunch of different things uh, related to making your prompt look cool. This was, <coughs> excuse me, was initially kind of more of like a Linux thing. Uh, people were doing more in like their Bash shell. Uh, Powerline fonts are a superset of just like regular fonts that have like letters like A and B. But these also have things like git symbols and arrows that are more um, useful in a prompt function than the ones that you would get without a font like this. And there's a bunch of different kinds. And so on this repo, there's a, a whole schwack of them. And there's a script for installing them. And if you trust the script, you can run it and install all those fonts randomly on your computer. Or you can just pick and choose the ones that are actually useful to you. So where am I going with this? Uh, and I apologize if it's a little tough to see, but this is my daily driver, and we're going to break it down. This is the prompt that I use like on my regular computer. It's on this computer. It's on my uh, work computer. Uh, it doesn't follow me around to servers because, it, honestly, it's not that important for me to have there because mostly when I'm trying to figure stuff out, I'm on my computer. Uh, but kind of moving from left to right, in the top left, I've got a history ID. It's telling, and I know this picture is small. I'll show you a bigger version. I've got the ID of the line that is about to run, and I'll show you why that's helpful. I've got the nested prompt level. I'll show you that again. I've got the drive that I'm in, which is super helpful if you're using something like ships uh, or you're using um, anything that has a hierarchy or a mounted drive on your system. The uh, name of the actual folder I'm in, not the full path, but just the folder. And then I've got some Git stuff and a bunch of special coloring and options that go there depending on what's going on in Git. In the, in the Git folder that I'm in. Uh, and then on the right side, on the same line, I've got the current date and time, uh, and I've got the uh, elapsed execution time of the last command. How long did the last thing I run take to run? Uh, and then you can kind of see in the bottom corner here, uh, it turns red if there was an error, and it stays green if there wasn't. So there's a lot going on, right? And we're going to unpack it. And the doors are closed, so you're stuck. So don't even bother looking at your phone either, because I'm going to see you. <laughs> That's my slides. Let's, uh, let's get to it, right? Uh, let me find a better place. For this. There we go. So this is my prompt. Again, uh, just to show you the bigger version from left to right here. Uh, and this is my prompt function. Well, more specifically, this is my profile. It's a, not the biggest profile I've ever seen. Oh, and I've got this at the bottom. It's 76 lines of prompt, and then it's one line of, I mistype code insiders all the time, but I want to have it open on the command line, so I just name a code. So let's ignore that. This is my prompt function. It's small, right? Like, it's pretty easy to digest. You guys got it all. Why are we even doing this talk? <laughs> easy, right? Um, Let's just start at the beginning, shall we? We're going to start talking about some of the ANSI escape sequences first. Uh, and I know there's a bunch of global variables. There's seven lines of global variables to start this thing. They don't all need to be global. This is just kind of uh, organized for me to show you in such a way that it's a little bit easier to demo. And I can go into the shell and actually use these things rather than have them only available in my prompt. Uh, you probably don't want these all global, right? Uh, I start by declaring a foreground prompt color. That is the text color, black. Very sleek and fast and black and awesome. Um, the reason I actually declare that globally is because uh, most of the time I want it to be black, but every now and then you'll do a presentation where you're using like light theme or something, and, uh, or using something that has a white background or a black background or whatever. It just doesn't work right. Like, it's nice to have it variable. Not blowing any minds, I'm sure. Uh, and then I've got a left arrow and a right arrow. That's cool. Did you guys know you could do this with the character accelerator and give it a hex code? That's neat, right? Um, if I come in here and I go right arrow, it gives me a right arrow. If I go left arrow, it gives me a left arrow. Cool. Uh, that's not something that you get with a regular font, but that's something that you get with a powerline font. 
uh, those um, highly numbered ASCII characters, because that's not typically different than what I did. Like if you go car, and then uh, I think like 70 is a printable character. Well, I got capital F. Whereas if you do character and then this big hex thing, the zero X tells you that what's coming next is hex decimal, right? Everybody knows that. Um, I'm just printing a character out to the screen. So it's fast, right? Like I'm not rendering anything weird. I'm just getting a character out of the installed font. So to do that, you need a powerline font installed. And I'm using not just the regular shell, but you can use the, the regular just PowerShell.exe or PWSH.exe. I'm using ConEMU, Console Emulator, and I've changed my settings. Probably hard to see. Search for fonts. And I've changed it. Uh, get out of there, console is. It's pulling it from somewhere. It's uh, one of the Powerline fonts. Uh, you set this up once and you don't ever think about it again. So I've got some arrows set up, because guess what? Um, when you start looking at the prompt itself, this interleaving effect that I've kind of set up here is done with those arrows. And is it relevant to my job? No. Is it something that makes me work better or faster? No. Does it look cool as hell? Yeah, come on. <laughs> you want arrows? So arrows. And uh, it, this is a pain in the ass to look at when you're looking at it in code, so I assign a variable to it. Even though the variable is longer than the hex code, I think the variable is nicer to look at than the hex code. And it just helps me remember what the heck's going on. Uh, I have the escape character saved there. Uh, character 27, if I just do it, car 27, it's like you just hit escape and then enter, right? Uh, remember, they're called ANSI escape sequences. They begin with the escape character. Cool, right? Uh, so I've got the escape character, so I don't have to look at that too much. And then I've got uh, the sequences that help you denote the foreground and background colors. Because these things get a little bit squirrely, especially if you're cheating ahead and kind of looking at how some of these strings start to look. You're going to go, that looks like crap. And you'd be like, yeah, OK, good thing you have these uh, these uh, variable names, that really helps it. But um, this is another one, like where you want to set the foreground color, it's escape and then an opening square bracket and then 38 semicolon five and then like a semicolon and then a number for your color and then the letter M and then the string that you want to put. It just rolls off the tongue, right? <laughs> so it obviously doesn't. So to save myself a little bit of mayhem, I store the foreground and background escape sequences in a variable so that I can embed them in a string more conveniently. Uh, and that's going to come in to play a lot as we go. Uh, and again, where do you find this out? The docs page is helpful. It tells you exactly what you need to be doing. Uh, and then I have just like a, um, a string called dollar $prompt. It just writes out my prompt. Like that is the content of the prompt because I write that out predictably at the end of my prompt function. All right? So if you have ever tried to work with a series of elements, you'll have discovered that a collection is handy. Like if you want to say, oh, I need this, and I need this, and I need this, and I need to go through them all and make a string out of them, uh, store them in a collection. And you might think, I'll store them in an array. And then you would have a poorly performing font, uh, prompt, and you should feel bad about yourself because there's better performing collection. No. Um, I'm using generic lists here. Is anybody in my uh, C Sharp uh, PowerShell command list thing this morning? A few hands? Yeah. Uh, so we played around using uh, different types of collections in there than just regular arrays. Uh, and so this is a generic list of script blocks. And it is, again, global, doesn't necessarily have to be, but I like screwing with it. And this is just kind of for me, <coughs> called prompt write. And as the comment, very helpfully and completely describes with no more questions, it is all the stuff that's right aligned on my prompt. So this is this, uh, if you can see my gesturing with the mouse. This with the time and date stuff and the elapsed time and the stuff that's on the right side is what's coming out of here. So let's go through it. Uh, and it's a collection of script blocks. And as you know, you can just execute a script block and get the output out of it. Uh, so down at the end here, uh, we basically just invoke all these script blocks and join the contents together. 
Uh, and we'll try to kind of go through it relatively quickly here. Uh, the first one is going to change the foreground color to whatever the error color is. We'll get to that in a second. And then this M tells the uh, console that, OK, this is setting the foreground color for the thing that I'm screwing with. And then the zero is just using the format operator to stick in a left arrow. You guys remember what left arrow looks like? Looks like that. You guys think you figured out what a left arrow that's got an error color of whatever I set it to looks like? Looks like that. Looks like, whoop. Looks like that, where I've just highlighted. So that's all that does. That, in completely easy to read, digestible line of code, makes a little blue arrow. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> it's kind of a lot of dorking around to get a left arrow, isn't it? But it's cool, so you like it. Uh, this error color in the actual prompt function, uh, you guys know what this does? This dollar question mark? Dollar question mark tells me, uh, it says true, okay, perfect, it's a constant, no. It tells me uh, the last thing that I executed, did that uh, complete successfully or did it throw an error? And if I do something like throw, uh, throw, uh, throw, oops, I got an error, and now if I look at dollar question mark, it says false, because the thing had an error. And notice how this turned to red, or orange, because Kanemu is fun. Um, I've got this set, if dollar error, so if it's true, then give me a color of 22. And if it's not, give me a color of 1. And that is being plugged in here. So this line says the foreground color, set it to the error color. And then this M is basically like a separation that I don't know why it's M, it just is. Uh, and then the 0, or sorry, the O, no, 0, I had it right, is the left arrow. And then so it's being plugged into that. So that's what a lot of the rest of this kind of follows. There's going to be a bunch of formatting in a string and then a format operator, and then the content that I'm actually putting in that thing uh, to be stuck in thereafter. So that knowing that and that pattern that gets followed for most of the rest of this is going to help the rest of this go faster as you'll kind of understand what's going on. Uh, so the next thing that isn't an arrow, is actually helpful in some ways, is we're setting the foreground color to the foreground prompt color. So we're just saying black because black text, okay? Uh, and then we're setting the background color to whatever the error color is. So you'll notice with a lot of these like arrows and interleaving and stuff, um, the foreground of the arrow is gonna be the background of the thing that it kind of comes with. And that's more easily highlighted if you look at like this one. Uh, the one that I highlighted, can you guys see that kind of okay? This black area is the foreground. The yellow area is the background. Make sense? Right? Uh, because I'm printing the arrow character. Now on like the one that goes beside it, the one is in the foreground, and then the background, I just want to be the same color as the arrow. So it's kind of a weird thing to get your head around, and I know I'm beating it to death a little bit, but that's how this like overlaid effect kind of works, right? And so like in this C here, come here, uh, that arrow is the foreground color of this purple where the where the drive letter is, and the background color is for what's next, because it's supposed to kind of go in between, okay? Again, if you don't get it, play with it a little bit, and it'll become obvious what screwing with the different colors means. Uh, so I'm setting the foreground color just to the foreground color of text, and the background color to the same foreground color that I set the arrow to, because it's kind of a group. And then what am I sticking in there? This monstrosity. This is probably maybe the hackiest, kind of fuggliest thing that I'm doing. Uh, in, in this, most of the rest of it is relatively good practice, but this is not. Um, I'm <laughs> saying here, uh, get history, right? If I do get history, here's all the stuff that I've executed in this session. And you know something cool? If I go, uh, actually, no, we'll get to that. Uh, but I'm getting this, and if I go get history, uh, just take zero, get all the properties. It has like an execution status and uh, when it started and when it ended and it tells you how long it did. And these are represented just as date time strings, but they have an actual date time object associated with them. 
So I can make a time span here out of the elapsed time, time span of start to end. But I've got a little, and I format that with this uh, C operator. String formatting is not what this is totally super about. But, um, and I'm taking the last thing that I ran, and I'm getting that time span. And that's what goes in here. And most of them are just milliseconds. Some of them are longer. Um, and that saves me from having to go back and check if I wanted to see which one of these performs better. Well, I'll run them both and see which one performs better, right? Uh, and the hacky part that I don't love, I'll be right with you, uh, is that if I haven't run any commands yet, just when you go and create a new window, it needs to put something there. But there was nothing to put there. So what happens? Uh, in my case, I just write out zeros because I'm lazy and I want it to look the same. And honestly, it's kind of just your prompt function, so it doesn't really have unit tests and peer review. So guess what? Zeros across the board. Uh, but why don't you just omit it? Just don't have it there. Well, b when you see how I do the right and left alignment, you'll, see, you'll quickly see why it's important to have something there all the time. So that's what's going on with that block. Kind of starting to roll along here. That's kind of what we got going on. There was a question. Um, which one? Let's look at it again. Uh, this duration, yeah, kind of. <laughs> no more questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> or anybody else who thinks they're no. Anybody who thinks they're smarter than me? Can, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See if it was peer reviewed, I wouldn't have that problem. Uh, so the next line. The next two things here, uh, so we take clear of that. We're still on the right side of the prompt. Uh, we've got this gray white section here that just displays the current time in a nice little format that always has this leading zero. And I should change that to 24 hour time looking at it now, but whatever. Um, it starts with an arrow as well. The foreground color, we're setting it to seven for good reasons. The background color, we're setting to the error color. Because if you look at this, Click one there. The background color should match this block. The foreground color should match the background of this block. And that gives me that little interleaved effect again, right? OK, I'm not going to keep beating it apart. Foreground color, background color. Uh, and so I'm sticking in another left arrow. OK, big deal. Uh, and then I'm doing a get date, and I'm formatting it in the way that I wanted it formatted. OK, I'm not even going to run that, because I think you know what it looks like. Uh, and that's the right prompt. That's all of this. Cool, right? What about the left prompt? Left prompt is where it gets fun. Uh, well, the git stuff is where it gets fun. Uh, the left prompt, you don't go arrow, then thing, then arrow, then thing. See, so you go thing, and then arrow, and then thing, then an arrow. So it, that order is switched. Uh, and the first thing I'm doing is I'm setting the foreground to the for prompt color. And you go, why do you need a variable for that? It's just it's always yellow. Well, it's not always yellow. If I open PowerShell, it's blue. If I run PowerShell core, I have it yellow. And that's just a visual indicator for me to say, oh, yeah, if I'm in core, I want to know. If I'm in 5.1, I want to know that too, or just PowerShell.exe. And the way I'm doing that is this platform color, and I'm just checking for if is Windows, then give me 11. And if it's not, because 5.1 doesn't have the is Windows variable, give me 117. And again, these colors are all in a table on the Ansible, or the ANSI escape sequences page, right? Uh, so you don't just put in blue and yellow. You put in, well, yellow and blue. You just put in the numbers that correlate to that escape sequence, OK? So. Setting the prompt color and the background color to that platform color. And then I'm doing this invocation and then the history ID. And I'm padding it to be four digits. And you go, why would you want that? That seems silly. Like, OK, this is line 23. This is line 24. This was line one of this session. This is line 22. And who cares, right? Well, I care. Because remember when we went get history? And I had all these numbers here? You can go invoke 
history, and then just give it this number. Uh, what's a good one? Let's go right arrow. I want to replay this line and go 12, and then it tells you what the code was that it executed, and then it executes it. And there's a nice little, if I go R and then 12, it does the same thing. R is just an alias for invoke history, right? And I like being able to do that sometimes. You know, it just because, oh, it was way up here. Oh, I could hit the up arrow like an idiot. Come on, no. Uh, wouldn't you rather replay the line? That'd be kind of fun. Uh, and plus, I don't know, I figured out how to do it and I kept it. <laughs> uh, so I have that. This invocation history ID is just the line number, right? Uh, and I stick that in to this whole big nicely formatted thing. I'm actually doing double string formatting here. First, I'm taking the history ID and I'm formatting it as a four-digit number. That's why I have these leading zeros, because I formatted it as a four-digit number. And then I stuck that into this um, with the color formatting and everything like that. And then a right arrow. Background color is 22, because uh, that's what's coming next for the background color of the other one. And then the foreground color is the platform color, which is the background color. Everyone's confused, but great. Uh, and then I stick a right arrow in there. That's this. Yeah, I can't see it because the yellow highlight's funny. Um, but that's this arrow between the 25 and the 1. Cool. Next, uh, nested prompt level is one that I find is actually pretty handy. Um, when you guys are traversing the file system, do you do C directory, C temp, hmm? or do you do push directory C temp. Push oh yeah, push location. <laughs> I said no more questions. <laughs> push location. Uh, and you go, well they both got you there, except one's longer to type. Even if you use, uh, and you know why I did that is because usually I use the push D alias for push location. Uh, if you do a get location, tells you where you are. Okay, big whoop. If I do a get location stack, it gives me all the history of the locations that I pushed. Not the locations that I changed directory into, but the ones that I pushed using push location. And why would you want to do that? Because push location has a pop, uh, pop location or pop D, and it puts you back to the one you were just in. And I was just in the same one I pushed. And I keep going back in that stack. And now if I do a get uh, I don't have one. I'll go push D uh, system, sure. I'll go push D temp. And you see this is just a folder name. We'll get there, don't worry. Um, and now I'm in a couple different ones. I'll just do a get location stack. Say I wanted to go back here, but these are nowhere near each other, and I don't want to type that, and I don't want to have to just like cd dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot. I can just go pop D. And now I'm back in the system volume information one. I'll push D into um, this one, because that's where I was at. And I could pop and push throughout the file system. And that's nice. I like using that in scripts as well, uh, especially where a script will go and change my location. Like you might run something that goes and sets your location to some random place on the C drive. And you're going, well, that sucks. I wish I could pop my location back to where I was. Well, now you can. And this nested prompt level thing is showing me how long that stack is. If you can see that, it's just a little couple of arrows thing because I'm fancy. And then a two, because there were two items in the stack. And then I popped, and it went down to one. And then I pushed, and it went back up to two. That's all that is. Uh, and I like that because uh, it's visually pleasing for me. It doesn't take up a lot of execution time. And uh, it's a reminder that I can just get back to wherever I was. And more importantly, it tells me when I shouldn't waste my time trying to pop back to other stuff. And so what that is, more color fun. And then uh, I get a variable for how big the stack is, right? And then this character, 187, is the, those two little arrows, right? Car, 187, arrows, little arrows. And it sticks all that in there. And then I do a right arrow. Uh, the next one is the present drive name. Uh, so, you know, if you go $PWD, you can get the place you were in. If you go 
dot drive, you get a whole bunch of blah, a whole bunch of information about the drive, uh, and you can just isolate the name, uh, which is handy because if you go uh, get ps drive, there's not just drives. You guys probably know this. There's not just drives for like your C drive. I've also got like a certificate drive and an environment drive, and I can go cd cert, and now I'm in the cert drive. And if I do a directory listing, oh, it's like the certificate stores on my computer. I can go uh, like ls current user and see the different certificate stores that are in there, right? And so I like having that just to kind of, again, visual reminder. Uh, and you notice when I did that, the folder that I was in got a little wonky, but it still put the arrow there, so that's cool. Uh, so I put that name in there because I like having that. And then this last part is just a split path on the present working drive dash leaf. You guys know you can split, uh, split path C temp, and it'll just give you that. And if you go dash leaf, it'll just give you the end kind of thing. Um, you, you're obviously well familiar with the regular PowerShell prompt that gives you your entire path. And it, I'm not changing this because I think that's not useful. I'm keeping this part because I think it is useful. I, and I like knowing where I am in the file system, right? It's kind of helpful <laughs> when you're navigating. Uh, but I don't want the whole big ass string that tells me that I'm in C, system only two, this, the, oh, okay, goodness. Um, just give me the folder name and that's enough for me. So that's these two parts. There's more. Now I'm in a Git repository. This is my presentation files, Git repository. And you know how I know it's a Git repository? Because of my computer. No, uh, because this purple master part showed up. And this is the name of the branch that I'm in. And uh, if I do like a new item test.txt, I got that in there. Uh, you know what, let's try a different one. Um, this one's a little wonky. Uh, I want. There we go. Uh, so that's that. All right. So the git part, I have to recalculate every time that I actually run the prompt uh, and invoke this stuff. And I don't necessarily want to do all of these things every time. So I've organized this. It doesn't necessarily have to be inside this prompt because you just invoke these script blocks anyway. Uh, but it made more sense to me while I was laying it out. Uh, so the first thing that I wanted to do on line 36 was, am I in a git repo or not? Because if I'm not in a Git repo, there ain't no point in trying to calculate all the information about a Git repo that I want to look at. So I do this, git config dash L. And that shows you like all your Git config information. And I cut it off so there's more. If you're not in a Git branch, or sorry, if you're not in a Git repo, you don't have any information on this branch. Uh, so let me... Just keep it there, uh, end. Uh, at the end here, I got these branch.masters and I got information about that. Not important, this isn't a session on Git. Uh, but if I'm not in a Git repo, I don't get that branch information. So does it match branch? If it does, then I'm in a Git repo. If not, well then, uh, don't bother executing it. So then I'd go if the string git test, which is the output of this, uh, is no longer empty, then I'm good. Uh, and I just realized that this match is uh, Boolean and I'm using a string operator to do it. Whatever. Uh, I want to go get the branch that I'm in. I want this git symbolic graph short. Again, not a git session, but that word just says master. Oh, and this word just says master. It's because it's just the name of the branch that I'm in. Again, not a session on git, but handy. Uh, I want to get the status. Am I ahead or behind in my commits? Am I ahead of the uh, upstream or am I behind? And then this distance is something that gets put together later. And so this whole big section within this purple line here is all just assembling that information that gets put in Git. Because if I go, uh, hopefully this one will do it. Uh, new item. I made a new item. And see how that little arrow changed colors from purple to kind of like a green, yellow, pea soup color? It was definitely my first try. So I definitely didn't just take the first color I hadn't already used that showed up good on a black background. Didn't do that. Um, see how that's that? Because if I do a git status now, I have a change 
to that file, right? And if I do a git uh, add, now I have the whole thing's yellow. And that's helpful for me. This is really like why I like this prompt. And if I do a git commit, now it goes back to purple, but I'm ahead by one. If I do a git status, I don't have anything to commit, but I am ahead by one commit. So this is telling me that I'm clean, I'm all committed, but I'm ahead by one. And that's what I'm getting here. If I was behind, it would tell me I was behind. If I did another commit, it would tell me I had another commit, uh, that I was ahead by more, et cetera. Uh, and so I like that. So how do I get that? Uh, I've got this, where I do the git diff dash dash staged, and that is doing me some favors in this area. And then I do the git status, status dash s, which is uh, changing the arrow foreground color or the branch background color, the git status, 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 bleh, git status dash s is telling me whether or not I need to color that arrow, whereas the um, git diff staged is telling me if I have things that are staged but not committed, right? Uh, and so it changes the background color of the whole uh, element there. Uh, and so if it's got a difference, I change it to this three color, and if not, I change it to that five color. So green, purple. Uh, and then this is for the ahead behind. So if you do this uh, git status dash sb, you get this stupid ass string that is just pound pound master dot 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 origin slash master square bracket ahead one. What the heck kind of useful, no. Um, this is sort of when you can tell that Git was developed by Linus Torvalds and he's used to working with string data in Linux. Um, wouldn't it be cool if that was like an object you could parse really easily and you could just like take the ahead behind property out of that or like even just pump it into like convert from string and just get magic object conversion? That would be cool. What are these pounds for? Do they have a reason? Does anybody know? No. I'm sure there's a great reason. Uh, why are there three dots in here? I don't know. Anyway, enough complaining about that. Um, so I have this regular expression that is basically saying, uh, let's work backwards this way, the end of the line, and then before that, if there's square brackets with word characters in them, right? So this is basically saying my ahead one inside of square brackets at the end of the line. Again, not a session on regex, not a session on git, just kind of something you can do. Uh, so I have this doing uh, more regular expressions for fi uh, figuring out if I'm ahead, uh, more for if I'm behind and kind of appending those values together to uh, stick them in later. Uh, and this distance is um, just kind of the beginning of the string here. I'm starting with the right arrow. Uh, and then if I'm ahead, I need to stick that ahead piece in there. Uh, this was the like ahead by one is what this is all coming out to be, right? Because I'm stripping that out of this data. I'm stripping this A1 out of here, right? Uh, and I know I'm running a little bit low on time, but you'll see here. Uh, and then I'm doing the same with behind. Am I ahead? Am I behind? And this is just, again, I'm adding to this distance thing. This is that distance block. This white block is being represented by that distance variable. Uh, background color I set uh, to white. Foreground color is set to the foreground prompt color. And then the escape sequences are a little bit unique for killing uh, this at the very end here, this escape. Um, square bracket 0m says reset, stop coloring stuff. Because otherwise, like, this would just remain white all the way across uh, because that's the background color. So it says after you print that arrow, stop doing stuff. Okay? I have that down here is where the important one is. And if there's no ahead or behind, then just write the right arrow with the purple color or whatever color it's supposed to be, the arrow foreground color. Okay. Uh, and then the git prompt is you set the background color, set the branch background color, depending on whether it's green or purple, depending if I have commits that I uh, haven't, or sorry, depending if I have stuff staged that I haven't committed, uh, and then put a right arrow, and then put the branch name, saw the branch name, how I got that, and then put in a distance, which is that um, white block, if it exists, right? Yeah, it might be nothing. I might be putting nothing in there. 
and so that is how all of the different elements are derived. So quickly, while there's time, uh, I take this left side, and I just invoke all the script blocks, and then I join them into one big string, right? Because otherwise, I'd have the output all on separate lines. I don't want that. Um, and if there is no git stuff, then uh, I don't have to worry about calculating it. So there's just a little bit of differences here to not worry about this git prompt variable that I've been appending to in here, right? This is that list, yes? Uh, and then the right side, same thing. Invoke all the script blocks and join their output. Because when you invoke one of these things, like let's do this one. This is just a script block, right? If I hit enter, it just writes the thing out. But if I go dot invoke, it screws up my colors because all it does is write an arrow and do some weird stuff. But it gives me that purple one with the green background, and then it royally jacks up my prompt for the rest of it because ANSI escape sequences are fun. Uh, so I'm invoking all those things and then joining them with no separation characters, obviously, right? I've got enough separation characters. I've got separation character anxiety. Um, so I invoke those. And then the only thing left to do is calculate the distance between these two items here. Because uh, I want to write this stuff out, and then I want there to be something, and then I want there to be the left side, or the right side stuff. And I wanted it to be on the same line, because I'm fancy. Uh, the only thing on my actual prompt line is this arrow, right? Well, where does that come from? I'll show you. Um, and so, this 20, so the host.ui, uh, let me just grab this and show you. This is the width of your console. And watch, if I make it smaller, number goes down. If I make it bigger, number go up. Guess what else it does? Ruins my entire life. <laughs> Clear in your back. It's not that big a deal. Um, but that is telling you the width of your console. The width in what? What unit of measurement is that? Is that pixels? No, I hope not. It's columns, right? Like consoles work on monospace fonts, where each of these things take, where each one of these characters takes up one column, right? So this is 112 columns wide, and I know for a fact that my right-hand side output is 28 characters. You know how I know that? Because it never changes length because it's always this date time function, it's always this elapsed time function, and when I don't have elapsed time, I'm filling in zeros, because it's important to me that this remains a static width. It doesn't have to, uh, but you know, uh, who knows why I can't just go uh, right hand prompt dot length. Arrow's not so important, but it's because all of uh, this stuff, where it gets rendered out into the actual numbers and letters, counts to the length of your string. Oh, that's kind of sucky. Uh, but it's, it makes sense, right? Because you're writing that string out. And so the length of the string includes the instructions that you're sending to the console. So could I have done a regular expression to strip that stuff out? Absolutely. Do I hate myself that much? No. <laughs> so I, that's why I decided to make the uh, peer <coughs> reviewless decision to say this thing is always going to be static zeros if I don't have anything to put in there. Because this 28 is a magic number. It, you guys are familiar with that term? Like, why is it 28? Because it is. So I'm calculating the offset here. The offset is just the distance between the left side and the right side. Uh, or more, uh, more explicitly, between the edge and where I want the right side to end. Uh, and then this prompt is I'm joining the left side I'm putting the uh, offset in there, and I'm putting the right side in there, and then I'm putting a new line, and that is where that little angle brace comes from. That angle brace is this angle brace. I put a, couple of, I put a new line, and then I put an angle brace, and then I write out my prompt, and I get oops, prompt. Real quick. Uh, I know we're out of time, but if you don't like the idea of screwing around with Ansible or ANSI escape sequences, 
uh, Joel Bennett, who is, whose talk you chose not to attend right now, I'm sure he appreciates that, uh, has written a module called Powerline, which abstracts a lot of that stuff away from you. He has another module called Pansies, which is PowerShell ANSI escape sequences. It spells Pansies. Um, and you can go check that out and install those modules and read through his docs, and there's other ways of doing this. But my way includes no dependencies, not posh git. The only dependency is git. You have to have git installed. Uh, it doesn't include any module dependencies or stuff like that. So now that I've shown you my goods, thank you very much for attending. I hope uh, you've learned something creative that you can go and screw with, if not for any other good reason than to kind of prank your coworkers. You can find me on Twitter. Join the Slack or Discord. Otherwise, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your summit, and have a good night.